Okay, so let's get started with some amazing herbal stories with Matt and Phyllis. Grab your cup of tea, whatever it is, and let's sit back and listen. Well, I better start here because we're both scared. We can't remember any of our stories right now. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Actually, though, I got triggered by there's a Diane Weeks, I think, uh, or Diana Weeks uh, from the Hudson Valley um, noted where she was from. And I will be teaching a class in the Hudson Valley. And I gave the address and stuff, Cynthia Lankanow. It's actually for veterinarians. Um, it's on animal medicines, um, uh-huh. um, bat medicine, et cetera, uh, in, in uh, Ulster County, which is halfway up the river there. But that also um, triggered me because Weeks is an old family name and my family. So I thought I would actually would start back with uh, ancestral herbal stuff. And uh, I know Ju- um, Judith. No, she's Phyllis. <laughs> hey, I but. She, Judith is so awesome. I don't mind. Right, right. <laughs> so um, uh, Phyllis has many uh, genealogical stories, too, or um, family origin um, when she was a little girl learning how to pick herbs and stuff like that. So so um, my, my tradition is not as uh, well. Nobody was trying to be an herbalist for the last couple of generations. My, my uh, great grandmother was what they call a green picker. They probably use that term that was Kansas. They probably use that term further south as well. So every spring she picked greens and um, that's what they ate. And um, also that's medicine because um, in the old days, um, you know, spring fever, we call, oh, let's go buy a bunch of stuff, spring fever, or, you know, or geez, uh, uh, all the girls are wearing shorter pants now and stuff, <laughs> spring fever. And, uh, <laughs> and up there in Minnesota, boy, you sure noticed that. But spring fever originally meant that you were getting sick because you were transitioning too quickly to vegetables and from salted pork and various things that lasted through the winter time. So you had to take your spring greens to slowly acclimatize yourself to the, um, to the different um, sort of um, diet. And a lot of them were bitters. And my aunt Pat said, uh, said, I only knew 16 uh, greens, but, but your, your great grandmother, she knew 24. It was an awful lot. She said, that's a pretty hard number. The only thing I remember from aunt Pat telling me is that um chickweed makes the other bitters less bitter is do you know is that true yeah yeah it's a little mucilaginous and neutral in taste so it kind of it's a little salty to neutral yeah but it would make bitter less bitter yeah yeah then however then on my my uh father's father's side that was my grandmother's side and they were kind of southerners so you know they southern kansas so they'd have a little bit common more with uh, your tradition there but up there in new in uh, new york on long island um on oyster bay where i'm descended from the weeks family of that particular i don't know if that's your family diana but um that's the family i'm descended from five or six times over because they all intermarried all those quakers and uh, and so um they were uh so one day I was, I'll have to post a picture of this. Um, I wanted a copy of a book called uh, William Buchan's um, Domestic Medicine, which is the manual that most people would have used in the American colonies just at the time of the revolution, a little bit before, all the way into the 1800s, before Samuel Thompson really took off with those books. And so I've been a bibliophile. I want to get this uh, uh, Buchan's um, book. And um, so I looked for all the editions that were under a hundred dollars um, and published in the 18th century rather than the 19th. I thought, yeah, I want that. So I ordered this copy and it came and I, I opened up, I opened it up and it said uh, Edmund Pryor Oyster Bay, his book. And then it said Thomas Pearsall, his book. And then there was a different Thomas Pearsall as well. It was like, Oh my God, I immediately recognized that was my great, Great, great grandmothers, uncles, and uh, several uncles. And um, so this is 1779 and Edmund Pryor. Yeah, I'm not descended from him. He'd married one of the sisters that uh, Thomas Paul, Thomas Pearsall um, uh, was um, one of the other ones. So, so this was the herbal that my family used in like 17, 
80, 90, 1800, like that on Long Island there. And there was a couple recipes written in, one for um, one involving frost weed or scruff. You, let's see, what's that called? It's a helianthemum, it's a rock rose. Um, geez, it's a really obscure plant, but it grows commonly on the, on the, um, Hempstead Plains there on the Great Plains of New York. And that's where that's where they were picking herbs. So so that was pretty cool to get an old family herbal back like that. <laughs> yeah. I bet. I bet. Yeah. It doesn't happen all the time. Yeah. Uh, so um I guess I could talk about my cousin Calvin. I don't think I've talked about him before, but you met him. You came yeah. and we went over to his dance barn and, yep. and, yeah, that, <laughs> and his barber shop. Remember, <laughs> do you remember that? So, so um, my cousin Calvin, Calvin Ralph, um, was um, English, part English and uh, Cherokee. And his great great grandfather had actually been one of the signers of the great, you know, his grandfather's grandfather had actually been one of the signers um, the, of the treaty the Cherokee made prior to the to the Trail of Tears, and that was, he was always embarrassed by that, <laughs> but, but yeah. uh, Those, that was, their hands were forced, but um, yeah, that was a terrible um, yeah, situation, and those guys were hated. And, yeah, uh, yeah. So um, anyway, my cousin Calvin, he was a gentleman's herbalist, and he lived way out in the country, and uh, his setup was he and his wife had their house and their kids were grown uh, when Matthew came over to visit. And then he had his barber shop and he did the old um, tradition of of herbalist for men and offered his barber shop in the middle of nowhere, literally kind of in the middle of nowhere, Countryville, um, for men to come in in the community and sit around and while he worked on somebody's hair and uh, talk about their health problems, and then they would leave with herbs. And um, he, he and his wife also had connected to the barbershop. Behind the barbershop was an old barn that they had turned into a dance barn. And on Saturday nights when the weather was nice, because you had to have the doors open and the barn leaked like crazy. The absolute worst country band ever couldn't get a job anywhere else. (laughs) (laughs) Horrible would come and play for whatever the door admission was. And he charged by the car load, like $20 a car load or $5 a person. And he would put plywood, big sheets of plywood on the the ground. And this is where you danced. And right. And all behind and all behind this house, but behind the barn, behind the barbershop was probably I'm going to say about 25 acres of woods where he gathered the herbs that he dried and made into little baggies because he did the traditional method of teas and decoctions. And then, you know, the men in the community would come in and see him and he would see women too, but this was kind of a a men's haven, a guy's place. And they could come in there to his barbershop and just talk about anything they wanted to talk about and feel perfectly safe. And if they, if there was a lull in the conversation, he told stories about people's Native Americans and are about, talked about plants. And so I, I could go over only ever so often. And the men got used to seeing me come over and sit. And they would, after a while, they would still talk in front of me because the first few times I went over and I was sitting there, they were like a little shy and didn't want to discuss their problems um but after i'd been there two or three times and my cousin calvin was saying no i'm i'm learning her herbs um they 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 relaxed and i was able to hear their stories and watch how he did herbalism and um 
He never charged for his consultations, but he did charge for his gathering and drying and taking care of the herbs. And um, he's also the family member that would tell me stories about my grandmother's uh, herbal and midwifery days from the 1900s, way before I was born. He would also tell me stories about her and kept uh, and how she had actually helped teach him because he was younger than my grandmother and how his grandfather had also taught him and his grandfather had taught him to identify trees in the woods um, through speak Cherokee songs. So there was a song for every tree and what it did. And, and he um, probably about a year before cousin Calvin died um, he um, said, you know, I had a dream that I should teach you these songs. And I was like, cool, because I've been like begging, begging for years. Please teach me this. Please teach me this. But he had two sons and he kept thinking one of his sons would want to be an herbalist. And then he, uh-huh. no, they did not want to be an herbalist. And um, so finally he said, All right. he said, I had a dream I should teach you. And I was like. Cool. I mean, because he had been sharing herbal information with me, but I wanted to learn those songs. And we had like two sessions um, out in the woods and he got sick and he couldn't teach me anymore. So I never really learned um, the words, but the feeling that went with it, the songs is kind of not describable. It was pretty amazing just to be in the woods and to touch a tree and to hear him sing the songs. It was it was like an amazing, awesome. I can't even explain the energy that you could feel with that kind of ritual. And I was always sorry I didn't learn um, those songs, but. You know, that's the way the dice rolled on that one. <laughs> you know, it's like he kind of held out to you. It was almost too late. So I really miss him. I really do miss him. And um, in the town where I live, there is a um, museum, um, which is actually on the natural National Registry called the, the Elvin Light Museum. So this is a museum that members of my family put together and it's full of um, old tools and old um, like medicine bottles and in just old stuff, right? That they gather. And I went touring there oh, about six months ago because I hadn't been in a long time. And there was a, a big picture in newspaper article of Calvin and he loved to wear when he did his talks because he did talks all over the southeast. And he wore a bowler hat that sometimes you see Native record with an eagle feather in it. And that mm-hmm. was his headdress. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I really miss him. He was like so connected. He was just so connected to the land and so connected to the earth and brought community together in a unique way, and it was just the community that everybody needed. I mean, it was like, how awesome is a place just for men to go and feel safe and talk, you know, and share their problems and all that kind of, and talk about herbs and their relationships and all that kind of stuff. It was pretty cool. The thing I remember most um, (laughs) stood out in my mind was this, there's this pond. Yeah. With this, oh, oh my, I'm at I'm at Ann Walker's. She also visited with this. I don't know. Did, was it alive or dead? Um, uh, like raccoon that they. It was did. a live raccoon. So he did dog races too. So yeah. beside the dog, beside the dance barn, was a oh. big pond, and um, up on the bank, it had um, a cable that went from one side of the pond all the way to the other side of the pond and then they had two boxes and and hunters 
from all over the Southeast would come and camp out in his fields and he would charge them like, you know, you got to pay me $20 a night to camp out my field and you have to pay the enter the dog races. So this is kind of and and Hazel Dean, his wife, sold hamburgers, hot dogs and Cokes to the to the crew. Right. And um, so they would put dogs, a dog in each one of the boxes. And then the raccoon was way up high in a cage. And this is a pet raccoon. And and then they would release the cable, you know, kind of like somebody's winding, release the cable. They'd release the dogs and the dogs would jump in the water and start swimming. And the raccoon would be sitting up there and totally safe. And the raccoon would be going, I'm so bored. Uh, and look down and like fling things at the dogs. <laughs> it was like the raccoon was in total control. <laughs> it was it was funny. It was amazing. And yes, yeah, I'm glad you remember that. It was that was unique. <laughs> yeah, there was anything anywhere like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. it's actually, at Christmas time, we'll put up uh, the. It would be two years ago that. Um, uh, my dad did a uh, um, talk Kansas boyhood dog stories, and he tells a story about a like a special kind of uh, what is something healer or some kind of blue healer. Yeah, that would go after coons. That was coon hunting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This was the best of all possible blue healers. Yeah, yeah, blue healer. They're good hunting dogs. My other grandfather raised hunting dogs, and he was called Doc Bright. His last name was Bright. And he was called Doc Bright because he was the herb doctor to the animals. This is on my mother's side, Doc Bright. And I used to go around with him to take care of the dogs because he did. He specialized in dogs and horses and mules. And so I would go around with him, you know, to take care of the animals. So I learned some herbal stuff there, too. I got one story that uh, my dad didn't tell. It is so fun, though. Um, so when I was a little boy, we we lived on the Seminole Indian Res in the big cypress swamp down there, 50 miles by dirt road to the nearest small town village. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and um, one day, and my dad was a teacher at a BIA school, which is like a one room schoolhouse and and uh, for all grades, you know, and um, and English was a second language. So they were learning, you know, and they'd only been in treaty relationship with the white government for 18 years so like before that they were just wild you know native americans in the forest you know but uh so one day this dog showed up in the yard of the school and the kids really loved it and they and they and after a while they started playing with it they would like one one boy would hold it and then one of the kids would run and then they'd let go of the dog and it would boom and knock him down to the ground and, and hold him down on the ground there and they just loved us. They go on and on. So, so after about five, six days, a sheriff showed up from out from way out, you know, wherever the outside world. And they were looking for this dog, and it turned out it was a, a dog that they use um, the, on the chain gags, you know, when they're making. No. <laughs> was trying to catch the convict and knock him to the ground if he tried to run away. <laughs> so we've been doing that to the kids, right? Yeah. They, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so um, somebody asked about lucky herbs. Mm. Oh, that's a good one. Well, us uh, agrimony, and um, we can talk about agrimony, single foil, um, Solomon seal. Um, there, I have like 10 pages on magical stories of agrimony. And agrimony sorts things out like it always breaks through the impasse. It's always good for hierarchical sorts of things. That is uh, uh, problems between the employer and the employee or the landlord and the tenant can work either way, whoever's having the problem. So there's just numerous. um, This is actually the single most reliable thing I know in herbalism. It will always work. It, it just never does not work. And it is magic. And agrimony will always bring the fairness in the situation to the surface. So uh, let's see. So one friend of mine, um, she was, um, I came over, to, uh, uh, we were going to go out that night. Um, 
I came over and she said, oh, I think I lost my job. And she, she, um, I, I told the story actually in another class recently, but at any rate, she, she was uh, writing at home on her computer and her kids would come at middle school, grade school and, um, and senior um, high and different times a day coming and going. So it was really good for her to work at home and, and have a home job. And, um, the brother-in-law, the brother of the owner of the business she worked for, said, no, no, we want them all in the office and we can, you know, look over their shoulder and tell them what to do. And she was working on, a, you know, three cents a word or whatever, you know, it was, she didn't need to be there. And uh, so she got, she, the, you know, the woman was the owner of the business was trying to enforce this and they got in an argument. And then finally they ran into each other at the hairdresser and actually the air company has something to do with the hair. And um, they got in a fight there in public. And uh, my friend was like, Oh, I think my job's done. I think it's over. And then, and then uh, um, we, uh, and so I said, no, no, wait, wait, we got it. So I had some single foil, the single foil leaf, stick it under the computer, stick it on the computer. And just that's where you do your work. That's what your work is. And we'll see. Yeah. And she said, yeah, well, it's, uh, it was a Thursday, I think. And so we're going to meet next Tuesday at the, um, at the, uh, at the office. And I think I'm going to be fired, you know? So, <laughs> so she showed up and uh, so I came by, I don't know, the next week or something. And she said, uh, thanks for the magic. I said, huh? She said, I went in to have this being fired and the woman, the, her boss took her by both arms and said, said, uh, we're, uh, we're, you're such an important part of this company. We'll just bend over backwards to do whatever we can for you. And we really appreciate what you do and blah, blah, blah. So there she was still at home working the way it worked for her. So, so that's a cool enough story, but then so she, she had this under a computer and one of her friends, she started telling this to one of her friends a couple of weeks later. She says, Oh, oh I can, can I have this herb? This herb? I, I need it. Please give me this herb. And, well, well, okay. And so the next morning she had a, a meeting with her boss and her boss's boss and maybe several other people. And, she, and her, her immediate boss hated her and wanted to get rid of her and um, was going to show how bad she was and bad mouth her and everything. And in front of the, the big boss and she was like worried she was going to lose her job. <laughs> so, so she gets there. So her immediate boss was 40 minutes late for an hour meeting and, you know, came in all huffing, puffing. Oh, I, I got stuck in traffic and so on, so on, so on. Well, you can't like try and fire. You can't like make someone else look really bad if you look bad. That's right. <laughs> Well, it was problem taken care of. And I've seen so many stories. It just goes on and on like this, either single foil or agrimony. And they really settle things always for the best. And, and in fact, if you are at if you're the one who is at fault, then the consequences are fall in your lap. And one woman said, Oh, oh, I see. I was the one who caused the divorce. <laughs> wow. Well. <laughs> okay. yeah. Yeah. Well, well um, um, let's, let's, yes, go on. Yeah. No, I was going to say I've always found um, sassafras very lucky for me. Oh. Yeah. And I often recommend it for my students um, just chewing on a leaf. So it, it was considered, you know, I was taught by old folks if you want dreams, then you chew on a sassafras leaf. Right. Uh -huh. And so if you chew on a sassafras leaf, then it opens your mind and you get to connect with whatever it is you're asking to connect to before you go to sleep. So I'm um, often recommend it to my students in class. You know, we pick a little sassafras leaves. If you want to ask to connect to the plant, choose sassafras leaves, go to sleep. And it works almost every single time it i just think it's really a lucky plant it's probably that's probably an old cajun use somehow that kind of worked its way across the south but it's a pretty common thing to do i i missed part of that so it helps you get a dream that solves the the problem or just a dream period uh, it helps you get a it, you ask for whatever it is you need to connect to understand. Oh, yeah. And it helps you make that connection and that understanding. 
Yeah, in dream time. Yeah. In dream time. Yeah. That's sassafras leaf. Sassafras leaf, not root. Yeah. Um, gee, did you guys ever use the mugwort the way people are using it nowadays for inducing dream, or is that a more of a comes? Yeah. It's, no, I, I haven't, but I think it's probably more from the European tradition. Yeah, yeah, and even then, there's some question how old that tradition is. Yeah. But it definitely does cause people to get dreams, and one of the interesting th- and to become more aware in dreams, and also kind of prophetic dreams too, um, kind of because as one woman explained to me, because you you dream of your future, what's right. I'm making that connection again. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. And um, so uh, it's, I, I would say, I don't believe it works as a tincture. You do got to take the tea. It seems like for the more magical properties of mugwort of uh, Artemisia, um, oh, Artemisia vulgaris, Artemisia douglasiana, whatever mugwort you're using there. But one thing that's interesting about it is that people have to, um, they often have bad dreams at first until they go through that and connect in a, on a better level with with those dreams. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. And I definitely know and had students and other people, I myself have not had illuminating dreams from mugwort, but uh, but you know, people who have, yeah. yeah. Well, you should try sassafras leaf sometime. Yes, huh? A little, yeah. Okay, a little harder to get the leaf up here, but you know, I'll be down there. Oh, actually, I'll be, yeah, I'll be uh, speaking the Mid Hudson. That's the farthest north I've seen the sassafras green stick. They call it up there because it doesn't get much bigger, wider than that, and it's green mm. at the young, young level. Yeah. Um, so, do, have you ever used Solomon seal as a magical plant, or know people that did? I've known or people you know? who who have. And um, it, here's an example. There, there is a, a friend of ours, an herbalist, um, uh, Stephen um, Buner, who was looking for some Solomon seal once, and I was like, he contacted me and said, hey, could you get send me up some Solomon seal root? And I went, sure. And so um, I gathered him some and sent him up. And a few weeks later, um, I contacted him and I said, hey, is that Solomon seal working? And he said, I just wanted it for its spiritual use. I didn't actually take it, you know, <laughs> but, you know, go, went on, it went there on, on my altar for spiritual use. And I was like, okay. Um, and so we had a, a little discussion about that and that I have not used it, but I've known quite a number of herbalists who have and people who weren't herbalists because it's one of those common things to carry in your pocket down here. Yeah. Um, in the deeper south, um, along that and or a buckeye, um, where it's considered lucky to carry around in your pocket. So, um, my dad did. My dad carried around Solomon seal and he would also carry around a buckeye and he would kind of switch back and forth on which one to carry around. Um, and I was like, what are you carrying the Buckeye for? And well, the Buckeye in the pocket was to get rid of arthritis pain and to help kind of keep negative stuff away. But the Solomon seal was to help keep you focused and grounded and people distractions out there and not like interfering with you. So that was Solomon seal. Yeah, not interfering. Yeah, so that is an old Afro-American remedy to keep from being beaten, or um, and that. And in uh, the, I noticed in the narrative of uh, Frederick Douglass, an American slave, that's the title of the book about 1846. He uh, he his master beats him, or he and he's sent to a reform camp where they beat slaves until they, you know, totally knuckle under and uh, he runs away and he's in the forest. And, you know, he, and this is Maryland. You'd say, Oh, he just crossed the border, but like, they didn't know, you know, he, he figured out how to get away by watching the ships go up to Philadelphia. It's like, Oh, that's North. So, you know, they were completely uneducated at that time. He was later 
but he's out in the woods and there he is walking around and, and this old man who uh, Sandy Jenkins was his name says, Oh, this old retired slave, I guess you'd say his wife was free and he was just, they didn't, couldn't get any more work out of him. So he was uh, living on his own with her and, uh, and he's out in the woods and he says, Oh, well, you're going to have to return, but you just take this route and no one will ever beat you again. And, um, and so he did, and he went back and actually he and this guy, the white guy that was the overseer there, they fought for two hours or so. They finally just kind of fought to a standstill and that guy never beat him again. And that was the end of his ordeal. So like, I, I, you know, I never thought this kind of a thing would come up again. I I don't want to give too much detail just to, you guys wouldn't know this person, I don't think, but um, so a friend of mine, she contacted me. She wanted, her husband was beating her sometimes and, and it would be just intermittent outbursts once every couple months or something. And it was pretty scary sometimes and she would, or she's going to have to end the relationship. But do you got a route that would, do you got a route like Sandy Jenkins in the narrative of Frederick Douglass? And I said, God, you've read that book. Like you, you know what that, or, or, you know, we don't know. It's not listed in the book what the route was, but that was the route primarily used that way. So I had her wear it like, and again, he did hit her one more time. But after that, I mean, it's the, her whole fate changed completely. And um, I don't want to get into the details, but it's like so totally different. It's like she says, well, yeah, he gets angry sometimes. He's more like grumpy, you know, but he doesn't hit her and stuff. And But it's also her outer circumstances changed so much that it just was like, it just was, in a, he couldn't beat her anymore because she was more famous than he was, I guess you'd say. Wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, that was what my dad did. So to stop people from interfering with him. Oh, he was, he was wore that too. Okay. Yeah. yeah the Solomon seal. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, it, what I've noticed about it, it straightens the way I would say um, it's what well, it was used for good luck per se, but I always feel like, um, so it's good for, if you were a baseball player or something gets your tendons in order mm-hmm. and, yeah. And it's, does that with your like fate tendons, the tendons of your destiny or fate, it just helps things move smooth quicker. So, so a story about those. So I add those two together, like when cannabis was not so legal as it is today, like those two herbs together are the most relaxing. It's like, Whoa, is that ever relaxing? And the- <laughs> Seven parts uh, Solomon Seal to four parts agrimony. It's just like, whoa, man. And um, so, uh, but one time um, I was teaching in upstate New York at, at, at Kate Gill Days and, uh, and somebody had to leave early. And I said, oh, 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 you need a lucky potion remedy. Like there was that uh, lucky potion in, uh, in Harry Potter, you know, it just somehow I just was inspired. Like on the, it was a break time between <clears throat> <clears throat> it was at lunchtime, break time. I said, you need a lucky potion for what you're going, going to have to face there. And she'd explained it, I guess. And I said, let's see. Uh, uh, let's see. Like Argamone, Solomon Seal. And um, I put in ghost pipe, although I don't, I try not to, I put in rabbit tobacco nowadays instead um, because that one's more endangered. But, but so, so, uh, so here, here, right, wrote this down and, and Claudia Keel, who runs um, Arbor Vitae School in uh, Brooklyn and New York City, she, she said, What, Matthew Woods, uh, 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 good luck, good luck potion. I got to write this down. So she wrote it down. So <laughs> okay. I totally forgot about this. And like she's introducing me at a class, like, at six years later or something she said and i got my matt's lucky potion remedy and it, it's worked you know off and on all these years <laughs> I'm like, what was it what did i tell you, you know? i want it back <laughs> tell me tell me <laughs> and she said well it looks it works for little things not really really big things and i, I said well like what's an example i thought this was a pretty big thing well well, my husband and I were totally exhausted. We both worked. I think she was founding the school, setting it up, and he was doing something similar. And they they don't work in the same industry, but they're just totally over and exhausted, and they needed a break. And there was a um, raffle for winning a free, all expenses paid trip to uh, the coast of um, of of uh, uh, Alaska. One of those cruise ships. This is about ten years ago or so. 
And um, she, so she entered that. And I don't, I can't remember. She thought in terms, she somehow she applied the lucky, maybe low, uh, lucky potion to the ticket or something, but she won. They got this trip and they had an excellent two week vacation. I thought that was pretty big, actually. Yes, it was really big. I'll take yeah. that. <laughs> Good. Right. Good. So. Yeah, so um, so those two remedies kind of straighten the way. And Ghost Pipe, at the time, I just thought of as moving you into the other dimension. Um, actually, just plain old tobacco will do that, too. You know, you use the Ghost Pipe, which is endangered. But, you know, uh, what would we say? Um, the roots, if you take the roots and you kill it, you know, and that's the part used, actually, in regular. Maybe if you just cut Pops or something use that for magical purposes looks like a little piece pipe but you could use tobacco and then the rabbit tobacco uh, i had a dream i'll tell you this is this. i had a dream one time so the fairies told me it wasn't native american ancestors or anything they they said uh oh we have a tobacco for you it's um nicotiana regular tobacco uh rabbit tobacco and um, red osier dogwood or red willow, which is a common um, kinnick kinnick. Mm-hmm. And, and then they explain that the tobacco took you from this dimension to the other dimension. Well, people notice that, you know, smoking your pipe, not smoking a cigarette, but smoking, it's like makes you dreamy, settles you down, relaxes right. you. Right. And then the tobacco, like they showed that the tumblers click on the other side, all the different possibilities of all the different creations of what could happen. And the tumblers are constantly, um, uh, constantly moving. And then they click, boom, something happens, you know, that's the new fate, new destiny. So they said, Oh yeah, this helps you find all the different tumblers. And then uh, for your prayers or whatever. And then, the red willow helps bring it back to this world, grabs it and brings it back to this world. It's like, wow, that really fits. And that's actually fits how we use those herbs, or at least so rabbit tobacco is for ancestral issues. Often I, I find it's really, it's the most close to a miasmatic remedy, what the homeopaths would call a mias, miasm or an inherited problem, it, especially inherited asthma. It's truly, you've probably seen it work for that. Uh, asthma from birth or the early years of life. Right. And, yeah. And I wouldn't put it past um, asthma from um, allergies, which kind of are attacking, you know, deep into the immune system, et cetera, kind of similar. And then red osier dogwood, I don't use, although I taught that one to Lise as a remedy for paranoia. And she's used it many times for paranoia. And, um, but that's that grasping things too tight, you know? Right. So, um, yeah. So do you want to do a question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, here we go. Well, I was, I'll just say what I was going to type, by the way. Red Osier Dogwood was the topic of the first Earth Day class, free Earth Day class today. And Judith and Lise talked all about it um, from and the, herbal, the perspective of medical astrology and herbalism. Awesome. Yeah. So there you go. Okay. Nikita is... Uh, someplace in this world where it's morning. She says, good morning. Thank you all. My question is quite specific. Now I'm going to use her terminology here. Terminology here. I wondered if either Matthew or Phyllis have successfully treated tuberculosis. I'm aware of the allopathic legislation and loss of patient rights in this context. I've also seen all the historical herbs listed in Matthew's fabulous Earthwise Herbal Volumes Just keen to hear if any specifics, personal experience, please. Yeah, no, I would have to say I had one friend who did have uh, that diagnosis, tuberculosis in modern times. He was an herbalist and he did try herbs. I I don't know that they helped. I mean, he had to do the drugs and so on, and and they definitely did uh, end the tuberculosis, but he had a bad case. Um, He got it at the hospital almost certainly. Um, and, uh, but the only other experience I have, so there's like the old books talk about, um, scrofula, like sores on the, on the glands, which would break open and they discharge sanies. It's called like a, 
yellowish kind of, it's like earwax a little bit. And um, I did once see somebody who had that, and that usually is actually TB. And this was in Australia, and she'd been raised, and she lived in Nigeria in West Africa for a long time, and then moved, you know, it's in the British Commonwealth to, um, to uh, Australia. And I gave her, I had her, I just happened to know the remedy for that is um, scrofularia or uh, yes, so it's scrofularia nodosa, scrofularia. There's a Chinese one. There's an American. There's a couple, there's a bunch of scrofularias. They're pretty interchangeable, but that did stop that discharge in that lymphatic um, taint or whatever. So that's the only time I've ever had any experience with it. So, well, um, yeah, well, when my mother was a little girl, she did have scrofula um, and uh, she was treated with herbally, but I can't tell you what herbs because she didn't remember Nobody remembered, but the tuberculosis of the glands of the lymph nodes resolved. Um, when I was a teenager, my dad had tuberculosis. Um, and so we all had to get tested because you're right, you lose your patient rights. And um, I tested positive, but not active. And so my younger brother um had testing and x-rays revealed that he had um, had tuberculosis and the scars were there, but it had healed itself. And my dad had an active case. And at that time, you know, you didn't have a choice. The police gave him, the sheriff gave him a, a week to get his affairs in order. And then they came and picked him up and they carried him to a TB sanitarium. Uh, we had to stay and take the drugs uh, until it was resolved. My mother, who slept with my dad every night, didn't have it, didn't get it. And so the health department thought because she had had scrofula when she was a young girl, it had protected her from, from con you know, contracting the TB. Now, it turned out that unbeknownst to us, our cow had tuberculosis. And so we'd been drinking that cow's milk for years because we had a milk cow. We'd been drinking the milk for like four or five years and didn't know that the, we were drinking milk with TB bacteria in it. Um, and so my dad being the milker, the cow milker, um, he had been in the closest contact with a, with a cow also um, and with the milk. So, we did do some herbal stuff, but we all had to take the drugs. And even if we didn't have an acted case, um, we had to take INH drugs, which are pretty bad. We had to take them for six months and didn't have a choice. Um, you know, the, the police or the sheriff was involved. So I know that would, that the milk remedy is a remedy. Um, and I've often wondered if, because the body uh, surrounds the tuberculosis bacteria and calcium and kind of, I guess, kills it. So the raw milk remedy was a common remedy growing up. Um, my aunt actually died of tuberculosis when she was 21. Um, my grandfather had tuberculosis when he was in his 70s. Um, so there's a lot of history in my family around this illness and I've done a lot of investigation into it. I, you know, I do believe if the case is really early and really mild that, you know, they're mullen and uh, Ella campaign and raw milk might be useful, but ultimately if it spreads any at all, you know, you have to do the drugs. And I would encourage anyone to do the drugs because I've seen what happened to my family when you didn't do the drugs. Like my aunt did not do the drugs and she died. Mm -hmm. All right. Sad stories. <laughs> yeah. We don't know a whole lot about that. Uh, one thing. Yeah. When you, it scars and that scars over, 
you never want to allow those scars to open up again. So you right. can always have calcium for the rest of your life. Or, you know, and you my can, brother has drank milk his whole life. Yeah. 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 You yeah. Gotta have calcium because if you have a calcium deficiency, then the, the tubercle opens up again and then it's no stopping it. And you yeah. go. Yeah. yeah. So that's the main thing that old time herbalism or modern could still help with and food. Yeah. Another question. Who says, I'm being urged to ask this question. How do you take into account a person's level of consciousness when consulting? For example, people who are used to being treated prescriptively versus people allowing energies of universe to flow through herbalists to them. Um, well, let's see. The first thing I find is, is that <clears throat> as you progress as herbalist, like you will attract people that work for you, that like there is some sort of similarity, like uh, your community, whatever your community might be. Like I started out in the herb store there and like I always got these crazy cases like they were always people that were you know complete iconoclast didn't fit into society contraries all sorts of different things and that's just all through my whole life that's they're like me that's the kind of people that i always end up um helping so it's like this this question arises less than you would think like like i would say if you are someone who is into prescription and then you're going to get a lot a lot more people like that if you're someone who is not <clears throat> you're not going to get those people. It's like they might think, oh, that Matthew would, and then they just kind of veer off in another direction. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that's my answer to that question. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. And this also leads, um, we are going to maybe have to face uh, John and I, Tara's husband, are going to try to, uh, well, we're going to definitely do a class and Phyllis will participate, I hope. Um, uh, on um, how to treat vaccine damage, which is really, you know, prescription, or well, it's not prescribed, it's just suggested people do it. It's sort of terribly hard to try and help people with the damage from the vaccine. But we're going to do a free conference on this sometime in May. Uh, so, um, yeah, much needed, Michael says. Yes, so, so much. Yeah, definitely. And we're going to try to allow for... Um, uh, student or listener participation. In fact, this will be less a case of us being teachers because all of us, we're really having a hard time. Phyllis has had some luck with methylation, we might as well mention, but most people have had very little luck helping with this kind of thing. You know, but I have two cases of thrombocytopenia I helped with. So, so anything we can share. So this is like everybody contributing that has any experience, including bad experience, like, like, um, you know, just um, what has been difficult. So, so watch for that. It will be free and we're going to get going on that. Um, so, okay. Back to the questions, I guess. Yeah. All right. Take to the newsletter. And if you, if you register for this class, you will get the newsletter. So there you go. Uh, Pam asked, do you have, or know of a book that talks about the fol folklore of herbs? Well, Phyllis, <laughs> Southern folk medicine. <laughs> oh, Phyllis can advertise her book here. Oh, yes. Um, Southern folk medicine. <laughs> God. I was just going with the flow. <laughs> God. Um. I think I'm trying to think of another book that was specifically kind of folklore, but I I'm not coming out with one. Yeah. Uh, what you want. I mean, there's a difference between books by non herbalists and books by herbalists. And there's just really a tremendous difference. Um, and like all those old ethnopharmacologists collecting evidence from native Americans or these or that, whatever, like, it just never reads right unless they are an herbalist. There's only one herbalist I know who did that. Huron Smith, you can look up the uh, or, uh, medicinal, medicine of the Potawatomi of Wisconsin and medicine of the this and that, about five, six different um, Wisconsin, Iowa uh, native um, people. Um, but that's pretty disappointing too. Uh, I would say there's some very good books I've seen on Irish um, folklore of plants. And it's pretty rich there. It has um, uh, 
Um, there's the seven sacred, the seven supernatural plants of the Irish, which include St. John's wort. And, um, you know, they're, I don't know, they, they're a plant. Well, St. John's wort helps you, you fly like the fairies, you know, there's various, and uh, actually levitate. I, I was never going to mention this. Um, <laughs> okay. And I did try to levitate and I, like, <laughs> Oh my God. And I actually, I went to a girlfriend's house there and I like laid down, I took some and I was lying on the floor and, and she's like, Oh my God, you're living. No, we both, she had to hold me like, and I would never have thought this is just crazy. Like, but Kim Dudley in his um, lectures in Canberra, Australia, he mentions levitation as a side effect of, of uh, <laughs> uh, well, that was a question there. Um, but yeah, so folklore, well, we're still generating it right here. <laughs> here we are. <laughs> but they are out there. Yeah, this is a good question. What's for obsessive, invasive thoughts, obsessive, compulsive? My favorite and how to make uh, move on and make peace with a traumatic experience. Um, so my favorite obsessive, compulsive thinking plant is a uh, horse chestnut or white chestnut which is really interesting because it's the Ohio Buckeye uh, cousins. Um, and that's from Dr. Bach. He calls it white chestnut. It's the great remedy for plants, uh, not plants, for um, thoughts circulating and just can't get them out of your mind. And they just keep on going. Uh, Ohio Buckeye works also, but it's a little bit different. Uh, it's, hmm, well, it's somewhat similar. So one can see why it would have magical use there. And um, there's even a specific pulse, and Francis Bonaldo and I talk about this pulse and these remedies in the book, in the, in the class on, well, in the book about pulses with Phyllis that the three of us wrote, and we talk about it and it's called Pulse Evaluation. You can get it on Amazon, I think, still. And um, then uh, um, Francis and I talk about that in our class on uh, uh, diagnosis and he uses passion flower for that mind state so adding that together those are types of things and even that that paranoia one might come in handy uh, do you have some remedies here to mention well i do also use passion flower for obsessive compulsive thoughts but but i also um use blue vervain it kind of depends on the person but one or the other yeah and there's yeah. been my two standbys uh, I get to tell one of my ultimate stories, the Blue Vervain okay. story. So, so I'd been gone. In fact, I was at the uh, American Herbalist uh, uh, Guild Conference in 1987 or something, or 80, uh, some way back in, uh, in Glorieta, New Mexico. And I got drove back and I'd been gone for two weeks. And I came to the store and started working. It was a really busy Saturday. And there's also, there's like five or six people around the maybe seven around the front thing and Bob, the owner of the store and me and another person trying to help people. And, and there's this one guy staying there. I need help talking as loud as he could. I need help. How come nobody's helping me? And then in addition is, is, Nick is going like that. I need help. How come nobody's helping me? And, and uh, Bob says, have you tried to help so-and-so? Uh, we'll call him John. Have you tried to help John here? And I said, no, I, no, I've been out of the, well, this, all this is going, he's been in the store doing this a bit. So I said, well, let's sit down. And so we sit down and we're, there's people walking around all over the place. And, and he's, and I said, so, so what's the problem? And um, he says, impotence. Do <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you have any idea from what cause? And he said, <laughs> Too much masturbation. <laughs> oh, God. This is like uh, movie material for like teenage boys or something. You know? <laughs> yeah, road trip kind of sense of humor. <laughs> well, I'm like, oh, oh okay. And um, um, <laughs> yeah, so, do you have any idea why I, or is what you, uh, cause for that? Or anything? He, thought, he thought he was weaned too early. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So I'm sitting there going, whoa, whoa okay. <laughs> and, and, uh, but this little voice in my ear starts saying, blue vervain, blue vervain, blue vervain. <laughs> it's like I never thought of vervain, but I say, well, I think I have a remedy that might help you. And <laughs> I forgot some vervain and, um, right out of the herb jar on the shelf. And I give it to him and he goes, ah. Oh. 
he just relaxed and i never saw him um twitch his head like that again although i'd always run into him at the herb store or at a bus stop or something he said you got a remedy for for uh impotence and <laughs> <laughs> so i um chalk uh blue vervain or vervain up to um uh, what do i call it uh um excess enthusiasm <laughs> well that's our obsessive compulsive behavior right yeah right. It actually has kind of for uh, sexual neuroses. Um, it actually has an affinity there. So that those other ones were just for general obsessive compulsive. This one has a little affinity there, although it also has many other uses too. So, oh, Sarah. all right. Another question. All right. Any of herbs in the wild? Saving people's lives, I guess, when you're on a camping trip or something. Yeah, that he gives examples um, like on a or, or, herb walk or up in the mountains somewhere far from a hospital where the right herbs just happens to be there. Well, that would just depend on what your geographical location might be. <laughs> well, do you got a story there that would fit that? Well, you know, I um, there was a hunter once that. Uh, had taken some of my classes, you know, he really liked hunting and he was out in the woods a lot by himself. And um, he had pulled out his knife one day and was, I don't, don't remember what he was going to do, but anyway, he ended up cutting his leg uh, like really bad. He's out in the woods, nothing around, it, you know, and he's looking around and he remembered my teachings on pine and pine being like antiseptic, antibacterial, and a first, first aid band-aid in the woods. So he got some pine resin and he rolled it up and he, you know, kind of packed the wound with pine resin and uh, stopped the bleeding. He wrapped it up and hightailed it out of there. And he had a bit of a walk to get back to his truck and oh. made it made it back to get it taken care of properly. But you know, don't, it's the lowly pine, but don't underestimate its benefit in first aid. It is really awesome. And pine grows almost everywhere. You can find a pine. And if, uh, if there's not a pine that has some resin on it, doesn't take much like hitting with a knife yeah. to get the resin to come out. And that's your quick first aid. Uh of course, if yarrow is present, you can use that too for severe cuts. Yeah, like yeah, you can. It's just not wild here. Yeah, so that's why. Yeah, why, which is why I said it depends on your geographical location. Yeah. Right. Oh, well, I'm going to tell a story, even though it's not entirely herbal. But so, my dear friend Susan, who's in my book all the time, is near death. He's she's always almost dying. Of this or that. And so at one instance, so she had Crohn's disease. And this is before there were as effective drugs as there now is for Crohn's disease, although it still kills lots of people. But but so she, it started to get, it started to flare up again after Bob and I in the store had stopped it. Graveyard dead, boom, for quite a bit. And uh, um, with calamus in particular, and um, although I've used yarrow for other people for the bleeding and um so it stopped for about 10 years and then it started to come back and she went to the gastroenterologist and his name was like, was really close to Dr. Asshole. It was like Dr. Athol or something like that. <laughs> okay. It's okay. Oh, yeah. so, and he was like, you, you've got a, a window of about two weeks here. You got to, we got to stop this. We got to use this prednisone to stop this or you're going to, or your intestines going to explode and you're going to have to have a, uh, a complete colostomy and you got and you got about two weeks here so take this prednisone so she took it for three days and she said i can't stand this stuff it eats my soul and um which is interesting the immune system, the lesson to me there was the immune system your sense of self depends a great deal upon your um uh, uh a, well there's a direct relationship between the immune system and the and the sense of who you are right That's, right and so, so she was like, well, uh, what should I do? Well, I'm going to just take my dog and go on a camping trip in, in the country. In the, and so she went up north, north Minnesota. She goes to campground. And, and her dog got into a, um, one of those uh, bee, bee colonies that's in the ground. 
Ground wasp. wasp. Uh, wasp. Ground wasp. Yeah, colony. And she had to drag him out of it. And she got bit 16 times. And she said, yeah, the funny thing is I'm allergic to bee stings, but this didn't really cause me to die or anything. I, I should die. I didn't have my Benadryl or anything. And I said, oh, the, the prednisone saved your life. <laughs> <laughs> so so when she told me this story by the way then um again i had this in my ear like almost uh, the past history case history came back to me gravel root gravel root so she's telling me this and it was like as soon as and she said if if god cannot save me i'm ready to die like she had you know she had an exploding bullet to the liver. She had like surgical for Crohn's disease. She'd had a ileostomy. Took six months to heal, like because she was so inflamed from autoimmune disease. So she was ready to die. If God can't save me, I'm ready to die. So from the moment she hung up with that gravel root, gravel root. So I called her up next day. I came over, uh, yeah, from present moment from the herb store and gave her some gravel root. And later we went out in the, oh, this is quite a good story. We went out in the swamp near my house and picked some gravel root. But the gravel root in the swamp had like um, concretions on it. Um, yeah, I learned from that, you got to pick it on uh, high ground more where there's stony um, rather than right in the bog or right at the edge of the bog or the lake. But um but so that it took her 18 months, but she slowly healed up. And then she did a Uweepi or a sweat lodge ceremony to um, thank the medicine men and doctors and people that had helped her. And I was there and, and I thanked gravel root and boom, it said right in my ear again, I wish this happened more often, but it said, you can tell I'm uh, you can tell I'm um, oh, let's see turtle medicine because just as grandfather turtle rose out of the sea in the beginning of time to create the first earth so too do i rise up out of the swamp to create the first soil i'm like whoa number one that's so complicated i couldn't have made that up myself that's like <laughs> it was a good one <laughs> like well the herbs have the same mythology we do that the earth sits on the back of an enormous turtle and then number three and it's a kidney remedy like, um, because water solid, mm -hmm. obviously there, uh, it doesn't show that it's a pus remedy, but it is a pus remedy. Um, and so I learned a lot more and wow, that it's a really powerful, lovely plant gravel root. And we saw it when we walked down there, I think, or we talked about it when you have it down there as well. Yes. So. Yeah. We do. You know, the meadow plants. Yeah. So that, that really did save her life. She went into pretty much a, a permanent, um, she never got it again until her husband died, her house caught in fire. And the insurance company re, did rebuild it. She got, you know, a series of bunch, bunch of stuff. She got uh, the diarrhea again and the, um, um, not, not bleeding, but, we had we used blackberry leaf for that just because it was diarrhea it wasn't bleeding blackberry a good um, astringent for the intestines so there's a great case history crazy but see so there that's the case histories i get uh, the crazy ones so. <laughs> <laughs> those are the ones you draw remember <laughs> those are, that's your community remember <laughs> good uh, yeah <laughs> um yeah. another one yeah you bet. So, Phyllis, does the scarring from the TB affect you now? I had a mild case as a child, but didn't know for 20 years. How could it be affecting me now? I've never liked milk. Um, well, still probably had enough calcium to create the scarring. And if it's not bothering you, you know, leave well enough alone. <laughs> Just uh, make sure you have a, if, even if you don't have, um, don't like milk, you know, lots of dark green leafy vegetables, broccoli, whatever, calcium supplements, keep your calcium levels up. And it was my younger brother. It wasn't me that had it, just to clarify that. Yeah, Susan's question there about one look for ginseng. Wow, there's not very many places left where you're going to find ginseng. We have pine woods, creek, swamp, high ground, and ravines it's really basically where where we are it's um yeah high ground 
north slope, gentle slope like that, um, and or maybe east or west slope too. But um, yeah, it's so overpicked nowadays. So yeah, I don't know that we could. Yeah, but tell your story about light gap. I like that. They they picked yeah. And then it and then it got a road name, yeah. Yeah. So there was a place that me and my family used to go park uh, when I was little. Um, it was like a dead end. It was like the old road down the mountain that was all grown up, and um, because they had moved the road, and we would park at the top and then make our way down the old road bed. But the old road bed had trees coming up in it. You know, it was going back to being wild. And so when they were doing new addresses for 9-11, they named that road Light Gap Road because my family was famous for parking there and walking down and hunting ginseng from that place, right? So I actually have a photograph of the sign. <laughs> that was like Light Gap Road. But oh. I just I just found out that at the bottom of that mountain that – um. And I talk about in my book, a cave and the blue hole where the fish go from the blue hole outside to the hole inside. That whole 150 acres of land are for sale. That was prime ginseng. It's where my family hunted ginseng. It's where the cave was. And I was like, oh, my God, if I was rich and famous, I'd be buying that right now. <laughs> I yeah, well, you know what? That's a, I'll check that out. Maybe start a GoFundMe. I would love to have that ginseng gland in that cave and, you know, kind of keep it for the world. That would be great. Ah, good idea. Thank you. I'll check into that. Yeah. Uh, uh, another question, Tara. Nikita says, one thing I struggle with clinically is resolving severe rigors with fever, even though the patient will be on correct antibiotics. I see you mentioned Cornus Florida dogwood for this. Have you any other recommendations, especially homeopathic energetics or other very low dose herbs? Let's start with Phyllis, because she's from the South where they had a lot of malaria in the old days where you would really get this. And even people long after they cured malaria, the old folks would still have these rigors and chills. Well, I've seen these rigors and chills just with acutely with fever, um, like intestinal infections, especially like viral things going through um, can cause it. Well, number one, the person has to be kept very, very warm. Just pile blankets, pile everything on top of the person um, because rigors is a kind of shock. Uh, in a way, it's where the body has moved into de- depletion, um, fluids are low, and um, you try to get them some, um, um, a little bit of, what is that water called? We mix salt, a little salt, a little sugar and water together um, to quickly rehydrate the body. That will help tremendously and keeping the person warm um, to kind of like, let go of that shock because what we want to do is trip the hypothalamus back over. So the hypothalamus is like moved into two shock position. Generally, I'm going to say in current days because of loss of fluid, extreme vomiting, loss of massive diarrhea will cause it with, with a fever or a long-term fever with the flu can cause it. So I do that. And if the fever is present, I try to bring the fever down and um, black cohosh is good for this. Just two or three drops of black cohosh in a little water. It's a little bitter, but it has a little, it's a traditional fever reducer and it's an antispasmodic. Um, so it helps relax the body. And I've also used blue vervain for this, right. but that's kind of my approach. Yeah, yeah. You don't see this as much. You do get it with flu sometimes, influenza. Um, yeah, so there's kind of two ways. I look, uh, there's two ways that you get these severe chills. One is like invasion from the outside, where you get a, a sudden severe chill, influenza or malaria or whatever, um, where it's really an acute disease uh, in its acute disease phase, rather. And um, that you, you can use a bone set, blue vervain, gravel root, 
Uh, well, I use gravel for the internal, but there are remedies that are the old flu remedies and those two remedies in particular for the very hard chills. So a rigor is a uh, chill where you're really um, shaking some, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and warm the person up. Yeah. yeah. And the other, yeah, so the old treatment often, the folk medical treatment, folklore, is like drink a pint of whiskey and roll yourself in a blanket and lie by the... Um, by the fire and sweat and then you sweat it out you you warm up and stuff and there are some dramatic cures like that um but at any rate so um then the other origin is when there's pus or material that's dying that's necrotic or that's dying inside your system and that's where the chills kind of come from within that could be yeah. chronic really deteriorating or some sort of some sort of process like that and that's pretty serious. Uh, first of all, if they haven't been to the hospital and the doctor, they should go. Um, my finding uh, several times I've seen it from dental decay, like they get like the proteins start getting into the into Blood. the holes. Yeah, and they get a chill and they get a fever and they could get so this is like hepatitis would be like this or chills in the kidneys or something. So they should probably be on antibiotics, but of course I've had fanatics who wouldn't do that. And anyways, even people that did go on antibiotics. So, so um, the gravel root is good for that, for that pus. It hates pus. It's really good for Crohn's disease, peritonitis. I've seen it calm down peritonitis three times. Um, stop it, uh, not cure it. But one surgeon said, yeah, it's funny. The pus pocket had broken open, but there was no, infection throughout the para, para, uh, peritoneum. And so it keeps down the pus, which is keeps things from really deteriorating. Uh, Baptisia also has this um, low grade thing. So that's kind of, it may be uh, wherever you live there. Um, on, um, I, yeah. You're the person who's in the morning. <laughs> Other right. <side>. All right. <laughs> Yeah, right. so, so, so actually less technological places you would have more of this than, um, you know, civilized, you know, but I would want to give herbs as well as um, the antibiotics for this kind of thing. And again, this is TB in the old days too. The abscesses would break open and you had to try and clean that, keep that clean. That's not anything that we've really seen in modern time, but they had herbs for all these things. Right. Yeah. Um, next. Yep. All right. Some great, a couple great last questions here. What herbs would you recommend for a boost in business for a small business? Whatever is the fat herb, if you want to boost your business, <laughs> I, mean, I hate to go there, but it's marketing folks. So whatever is popular, make sure you have it. Well, here we'll go to some magic that was taught us up in Minnesota by he who must not be named. <laughs> we also lived and taught down in uh, Arab down there, but of all things in Arab and in South Minneapolis, <laughs> where the two of us lived, even though we didn't know each other. We didn't know each other. <laughs> um, and he taught uh, to um, put sprinkle iris on um, things that you want to sell. So he'd say like, he'd give his own example. So you're at the powwow and um, you, um, nobody's, you want people to come and look at your, your table with all your jewelry and stuff that he was, a, he'd make stuff like that. And so you sprinkle um, uh, blue, uh, blue flag, um, iris, um, wild iris um, um, that you concocted uh, on your table. And that would attract people and attract people, but there's always a payoff. He'd always, to say there's always a payoff for using magic and here so you're going to end up with some like teenager who has no money who like just sits sits at your table and like looks at things and it won't go away because they're like drawn in so you gotta you gotta give a free thing away every once in a while too so, so that's the problem with but so to demonstrate this so he's not going to just like tell us this and he's going to demonstrate it so one of the women in um in the uh class um attractive but in her mid 40s um uh, um or maybe a little bit late about 46 or so um so he said okay you're coming with me to the gay bar 
because he's gay and it sprinkled this in your hair. And so, and so they went, they went in and all these guys are all just flocking around her. All <laughs> <laughs> so it's like ah okay <laughs> uh. <laughs> all right last one yep how has your practice as an herbalist influenced your spirituality over the decades and how has your spiritual practices affected your ability as an herbalist i just kind of feel like that should be a whole hour that could be a whole hour absolutely Actually, that's how I talked about my, yeah, my, the spirituality came first, the herbalism second. And I talked about that some in the class with Susan Leopold an hour and a half or two and a half hours ago. And if that's available, either from us or the um, UPS, um, you might, that gives my history there. I, I'm in Madison, Wisconsin here where my mentor who first taught me that nature is alive, nature is alive, Dr. Francis Hull, where he lived and later passed on. And um, he passed on that inner knowledge, just that feeling. It's like nature is alive. And it wasn't just an idea. It was like a knowing. And, uh, and I had to believe it or leave truth behind, you know, as 11 at the time. So that was the whole beginning for me. I've described that a few times. And uh, yeah. So. And I, I guess mine just, you know, the super, super short version, uh, even being a little kid and, knowing and realizing that everything is connected and that everything is God. We're all God. Everything is God. If that's the term that you chose and growing up (laughs) as a Christian, that, that God was, you know, the term, but understanding that we're just all super connected. And I, I can't say if spirituality or plants, they just, they came together. There wasn't one came first and then the other. We were, we were, we always were. Um, from the time I can remember being hardly even in school, we always were. We were disconnected. Yeah. Well, that's a great place to end. Yeah. It's very lovely. I'll show people where they can watch the previous recording and, and all that stuff. How about that? All right. Bye, y'all. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Um, Let's see. I will try to post that. Let's see. I did. Okay. All right. I sent you that link for the West Virginia forest we're trying to save. Maybe if you can put that up on chat or something, or I'll I'll try to do that while you're doing this. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. So we still, the three classes in one great day for Earth Day are available. Uh, We have uh, an Earth Day coupon, which will be valid over the weekend. And that's valid on all classes on the Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism, except for the Herbs A to Z, which is already already only $8. And then Family Herbalist course, which is already discounted 20% for the early bird discount. If you find yourself having trouble with where to put the coupon, so first of all, the coupon code is right here. Uh, There is a handy dandy link here that will show you where you can Uh, where you might be having issues. And then, so our first class today was herbalism and astrology. Absolutely fascinating with Judith Hill and Lise Wolf, both teachers at the Institute as well. And they went over Red Osier Dogwood from the perspective of a medical astrologer and an herbalist. And just a really fascinating discovery-oriented conversation that you can check out already. The recording is available here. And then just a couple of hours ago, Matt had a wonderful conversation with the president of the United Plant Savers, Susan Leopold, and they discussed nature is alive. So just kind of the ending point of today's class is, you know, the the animism, right? The 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 real in well, you can read this here. So <laughs> um, that nature really is alive. I think we all, especially in this audience, get it and is woven throughout the curriculum at the Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism. And so they both share their perspectives on on how that essentially kind of grabbed them in their life and this journey with the plants as well. And then very shortly, the link will be available to view the recording for this class as well uh, on the homepage here. And I will also be sending out an email very shortly here with the recording links as well. And then, as I mentioned, the Family Herbalist course is starting soon here with Lise Wolf. 
basically any problem that comes up in the family household, adults, children, the most common things to maybe something that you might not think of is herbs being a part of the, the home herbalist program, such as sibling rivalry, or maybe you're just a burnt out parent you know, colds and flus, of course, and scrapes and burns, of course, and just a, a wide variety from the physical to the emotional ailments. Definitely check this out here. The early bird discount ends on Monday, along with the Earth Day coupon. And so check out what's what's in store for this class. We record all of our classes. So if you can't make it to a live class, you can watch it when it works for you. And then if you're wondering you know, where can I get more of this? Like nature is alive and, you know, there are clues and hints and plants. This uh, Doctrine of Signatures is a free class series that the first intro class is by Matthew Wood and Lee Arnoldy, who guides us each month with a new herb, discovering the, the signs, the symbols, the scents, the locations where the plants grow that indicate what the plants uh the healing potential is. And so you can learn about that and join that, that um, ongoing conversation and ongoing class for free here. And then also we have special offers on our fantastic beginner courses. I say beginner or review because th there's so much that it it's easily forgotten if it's not, you know, constantly uh, reviewed or used. So we have herbal medicine making, we have plant walks with Lise Wolf, and we have holistic herbal assessment skills with Matt and Phyllis. And these are pretty self-explanatory. Check out the free intro videos, but especially the holistic herbal assessment skills is more about setting up a clinical practice and how to conduct a consultation, which a lot of people ask about, you know, there's, there are very different aspects to an herbal practice. And so the holistic herbal assessment skills really helps you on that business and initial consulting end. You get to witness as Matt and Phyllis in their decades of experience to conduct consultations as well as follow-up consultations with people and, and really learn from their expertise. And so it's really a terrific course to help you to learn those specific skills, the clinical skills. We have a bunch of additional, just ongoing, terrific content, amazing blog content. And then something else that I wanted to show you is if you go to all courses at the top here, Phyllis is really a big contributor at contributor at the Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism. There are a number of courses with Matthew and Phyllis, and this coupon does apply to all these additional classes. So we recently completed the Herbs in the Male Reproductive System and the Neuroendocrine Series, uh, which had four classes. You can buy this as a uh, grouping or individually. And as you go through, you can page through, there's just a plethora of content and information if you're wondering, so as you see here, there are at least 11 pages of options here. Uh, so there's a lot to scroll through. Here's more herbalism and the thyroid. But if you're wondering, for example, uh, I'm trying to remember one a topic that someone had inquired about before, but let's just say you are wondering about thyroid. You just type in thyroid. Keep this search simple. Just one word will do. And you'll see all the, the classes and courses related to the thyroid. Or let's see if by chance, sometimes this one's a little bit more uncommon, but let's type in tuberculosis. That one did not come up. That one's a, not as common. Um, but we might put in the flu, for example, and we can see where the flu is mentioned. Uh, Alberto did make a good point that in the course... The, on the lymphatic system, that there would be information at least about addressing the, um, the lymphatic or we have the respiratory. We have a respiratory system class that could cover that. So you might, if, if you're concerned about, if you're trying to look up a course on a specific ailment, you also might look up the organ system associated with that ailment and that could get you some um, good solutions and help as well. So once again, the Earth Day coupon is for 20% off 
all courses except for the herbs A to Z, which is only $8 a month for access to over a hundred hours of content and, uh, and any upcoming class, uh, live online class. And then we have the family herbalist course, which, which starts soon with Lise Wolf. That's already discounted. So the coupon does not apply. And all that is until Monday, April 25th. Uh, if you're having issues with the coupon, please check out this link right here. Um, help. If you need help, you can email us at hello at woodherbs.com and we're happy to help you out there. And I'm going to check the chat to see if there are any questions that I can answer. looks like Alberto's have been helping out really well, providing links and the coupon code and so forth. So wonderful. Oh, there we go. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, I'll send that. You can. Yes, sounds good. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bryce. It's definitely our pleasure. It's been a wonderful day. And I'll wait just a few more minutes to see if anyone else has anyone, any more questions. Good night to you as well. And stay tuned to the newsletter for announcements, of course. I'll be sending out the links for, for this recording, but you can also just go to the homepage. You will need to re-register. It's just safety settings they have these days as far as privacy for webinars. They're just much more stringent these days. Uh, about those options, but you can um, easily sign up there, check out our calendar. All right. If there aren't any more questions, let's see, I'll check the chat once more. Okay. All right. It's been a wonderful Earth Day day. It's been a pleasure to put on these classes for you. Let us know how you enjoyed them. You're obviously sticking around and enjoying it. Um, but if you would like more like this, we always love hearing your feedback. It's very helpful for us as well. And uh, anyways, thank you so much for your participation. It's been a joy, a lot of fun. Have a wonderful night, everybody, or day, wherever you are. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. If you are interested in learning more, you can visit our website at matthewwoodinstituteofherbalism.com. You can find all of our social links in the description below. Also, please subscribe to our channel so you can keep up with the latest videos.